Hello, pet enthusiasts. My name is Jason Zakowski, aka Dad Guy. I am the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker, the science communicating dogs on Twitter. Normally, I have a co host, my wife, Chris, but she's getting her nails done because she deserves a me day. So I'm running Twitter by myself. <laughs> Every week on Pet Chat, we tell stories about our pets, but we have a very special space today. We have linked up with this amazing dog trainer, Christine Young, who is part of a dog lovers club on Clubhouse. And uh, we're going to do a little brief interview, talk about a big thing that happens with dogs, and then we'll take questions from everybody. And we'll try and take turns between... um, We'll try and take turns in between Twitter spaces, Clubhouse, and even Wisdom. So without further ado, Christine, how are you doing? I'm doing well. And just if we can start with having you make me a moderator as well. Oh, I'll I got to make you a moderator here, right? Uh, yeah. I'll make moderator. Be able to put links on and help I'm with people who want to ask learning. questions. There we go. I clicked make moderator. Is that working for you? It's working. Okay. It's working fine. Oh, Chris is here too on Twitter Spaces. Chris, aren't you getting your nails done? I am right now oh as we goodness. speak. And oh, this is here weird. Fiona, but Fiona has two dogs, that, <laughs> and she's really excited uh, to be part of the conversation. No. I am. I am. No, now if you are, if this is the first time you've joined a simulcast, it's a bit of a thing. So on Clubhouse, you will hear everybody speaking through my icon, the Bunsen and Bur- Bunsen and Beaker icon. Um, so everybody on Twitter Spaces, the audio is being funneled through me, and everybody on Clubhouse. When they speak, it's going to be funneled through my icon on Twitter Spaces. So Christine has an icon on Clubhouse, but you can't see her on Twitter Spaces. So the audio works. It's like magic, um, but I think we're going to have a great show. So the first thing I'm going to ask you, Christine, is what we ask all of our guests right off the top is, where in the heck are you in the world? I am in Encinitas, California. By a train. Yes, I moved right close to a train, which it'll probably go off a few times during our interview. <laughs> okay, right. And you, we were talking, you were, you had moved from somewhere. I was in Solana Beach and I moved right down the street oh, to okay. Encinitas. Right. And I haven't been able to unpack boxes and find my life yet. I'm getting there. Well, you know, that I've, Chris and I moved from a trailer to the house we built on the farm property and it took us like a year to move all our stuff. So I know what that's like. It was the worst. Um, (laughs) now you are a dog trainer. Could you tell everybody a little bit about your experience training dogs? Just so, you know, everybody on clubhouse, I think knows who you are. Uh, people on Twitter spaces have no idea or wisdom. Sure. And I started in the animal training field about 25 plus years ago as a horse trainer, I adopted a wild Mustang. And I was smart enough to get one of the best trainers in the area. And long story short, he, decided to not tell me the challenge I took on. And he kind of taught me not just to manage my new horse. I was a green rider with a green horse. It was Mm. crazy. And because I had to learn so much, I soon started training with him. And when I moved to California eight years ago, I was going through a big transition and I decided to take a break from all the work that I was doing that was a bit outside of that at that time. And I was like, I'm just going to walk dogs and figure out my life after I walk dogs for a little bit. And I got back online to see what was happening in the dog training world. And I had always trained my own dogs, but I hadn't paid attention for a long time. And I have been hooked ever since. I haven't put down the computer to find more education about what we can do with dogs. It's so amazing what has happened in 25 years with animal training. Oh, I love that. Um, we love our dogs so much and we're part of a big dog community on Twitter. So it's just, it warms my heart to hear somebody else that just loves everything about dogs. And there's a lot of good science in the training of dogs today, right? Before it was a bit of guesswork, but the, the science is completely backing up some of the newer training techniques. Yes, and it changes yeah. really rapidly. And I just love being part of a community that stays involved in continuing education so we can all help each other know what the latest methods that help the most are. Now, do you do you have a dog training academy? Do you do stuff online? Do you book clients? How are you you have some kind of business with dog training, I think. 
I do. I do both in person and online clients. Mm -hmm. My specialty is puppies and recall work. Uh And um, I do private sessions and I do, I have a recall course. Um, There's a mini version of that recall course as a, um, that you can purchase online, but my um, co-trainer Kelly and I teach a big course online for recall that I don't know the next time we'll be teaching that because I am working on a membership for training for people that want to work with puppies and recall work. So that's been my focus for online work. Now, the link that you sent to me on Twitter, is that part of your um, your website? Like, is that something I should tweet out on Twitter? Yes, that's okay, the I'll get three, to that, you four betcha. rules of recall. Okay, I will... That's- I will put that out in a second. Sure. <laughs> Just multitasking. <laughs> I bet you are with three of them today. <laughs> <laughs> so have you owned many dogs in your lifetime? I have. Um, and I've often had two. And be- when I became a trainer, I-, I wish I could have 10 because I love them so much. But I've had Pico, who's six years old for the last six years. And he's the only dog that I have right now so that I can take him to work with me every day that I do in person. He's part of the socializing process with puppies. Oh, and I- Yeah, it's really cool that I get to take him. I have a whole cooling system that he gets to stay in until I need him and did all the conditioning work. So he was comfortable hanging out at my vehicle until I need him. Now, is there, this is a tough question because I've asked other dog trainers the same thing. Is there a specific breed of dog that you like? Do you love all dogs equally? Is there something that's on your heart for a type of dog? It's a great question. And I'm always asking other trainers as well. You do? Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. Because it's such a, prior to becoming very involved in the pet industry, I definitely, like many people, went for what I had as a kid and looks used to be my priority. Understanding what dogs are bred for and how it matches with my lifestyle and how many dogs I've been exposed to and gotten to know, I never would have thought of having any small dogs. Pico is a mini Aussie. I was always a big dog person. And I decided to get a, he's a big mini Aussie because I didn't want (laughs) to not have a big dog because I love them so much but there is probably 10 small dog breeds that I would be happy to have and I'm so surprised by that and without the exposure and understanding you know 10 years ago you I would never have wanted a small dog and being a big dog person I think I'm kind of done with some of the really big breeds just because of mobility and understanding their lifestyle and where I live in California doesn't really suit them well Mm. You ha- yeah, like if you get a, I don't know, like a, a Newfoundland, right? Right. They're, right. You kind of need to be around water because they love to swim and it needs to be not smoking hot all the time or because they're so fuzzy. So yeah. I see. Yeah. We've got a Bernice Mountain Dog and man, does he love our winters, I'll tell you, because we're in Canada, like in the middle of Alberta, Canada. So he is just suited for our winters. Um, I'd imagine if we had some Chihuahua, it probably wouldn't stay outside very long. Right, right. <laughs> no. And right now I'm oh, go ahead. With, um, just to f- answer your question kind of the long way is I'm pretty attached to the herding breeds and the more operant dogs with having a hiking lifestyle and wanting a dog that can be a demo dog is where I lean towards. Mm. But I also, uh, I'm, I love, if people don't know about it, the Functional Breeder Group and functionalbreeder.org. There's so much going on there for good breeders and breed crosses that I'm super interested in. So if you're a dog geek and want to find out more about what dog to get, there's just so many interesting conversations with that group that really can guide you for the right dog for your lifestyle. We did this fun game on our pet chat on Twitter last week where um, there's a website where you can mix and match different dogs and spits out what they're called. Right, because like when you mix a dog with another dog breed, there's some of the names are kind of funny, and the, there's one that I I was shocked. It was a Irish Wolfhound and a Greyhound. What they were called when they're mixed together, I had no idea. But they're called. <laughs> do you know? Do you want the? Do you know no, what they're called? No. Oh, they're called a long dog. That's what the the actual name of the the mix is as a long dog. I was like, what? <laughs> Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't know where that link is. Um, if I can find it, I'll, it w- while I'm running everything here, I'll send it to you because it's it's kind of cute. You can mix like, oh, there's a golden retriever and you mix it with a Labrador. Everybody knows those, but there's some exotic mixtures that you wouldn't think of before. So, yeah. 
Um, so on to kind of the on to kind of the the meat and potatoes of the, of the interview before we open the floor to questions. Um, I would like to ask you uh, the big question about recall. So recall is what we were going to talk about for the main concept today. And w- how would you like to go over that? Would you like to talk about the four rules of recall or like common mistakes? The floor is kind of yours because you're the expert. Sure. I think it's always helpful to start with the four rules and I won't okay. go as in depth to them as I do because that link that I put um, that if people are in Clubhouse want to get the link or if you share the link, that will go into a little bit more in depth about each of those rules. And when you start with those rules, it answers a lot of questions on the when people hear the four rules, they're like, oh, I'm not doing that. Maybe that's part of my problem. And so I'd be happy to review the four rules and we can just kind of go from there. And I just want to share that, you know, my passion for recall came from, I had, I've always had well-trained dogs, but when I was a horse trainer, I had everything down pretty reasonable for not being an official dog trainer, just loving training. But I never got a handle on recall when I was, um, I was doing endurance racing with horses. And if they saw a deer at certain places at certain (laughs) times, boy, did I not get my dog back. And so when I decided to get officially into dog training, that's what I went after from the beginning. And I was, I've studied with recall trainers all over the world to figure out how do I want to recall train and what is the best way for me to teach that to people? You know, this is so important because uh, Bunsen has really good recall. He's our Bernice mountain dog and Beaker is so prey driven if she's like i would like to learn too because if she sees something that is prey to her it's like who let the dogs out <laughs> she is gone <laughs> yep. so um like a rocket so we we probably could learn a thing or two from you christine so go ahead okay so let's start <laughs> with one of the first easy rules to try to follow is call once Mm. And so many people want to, whether it's sit, 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 sit. And if you say sit five times or come, 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 when you repetitively cue something, you're teaching your dog when I say come five times, that's when I'd like you to come after I say it five times. Mm -hmm. And the repetition that we do is because we haven't taught the behavior well enough. It has nothing to do whether or not your dog understands that word. It has to do with, have you taught it in a way that your dog understands it and wants to respond to it? So if you follow the rule to call only once, to cue everything one time, and to learn what to do in order to get that behavior, instead of just verbally saying things that your dog doesn't listen to, (laughs) that can make a huge difference. So yeah, I've, I've heard that before our dog trainer, um, here in red deer, that's what she says is, you know, after the first time, if they don't do it, well, you got to do something else. Um, yeah. And let's start with, um, besides the four rules, I want to encourage everyone to do the name game because one thing you can do before you even call once is to do the name game and name game is a really simple game where you're going to get a handful of treats. And anyone who's listening now, if your dog's nearby, just go grab some kibble or a handful of treats and make sure your dog's very close to you, say their name and give them a piece of food. Uh-huh. It's your job to give them food every time they hear their name. We are classically conditioning them to enjoy hearing their name, especially if you've, quote unquote, poisoned your dog's name by screaming, (laughs) Fido, get over here, Fido, come. You know, we can, you'll see in the four rules how we've ruined their name. So Mm -hmm. if we do the name game, we recondition it. I don't want that to happen. I sometimes, (laughs) the only time I've yelled at Bunsen is when he's grabbed a moose leg or deer leg from the wilderness of Alberta. Um, and I'm like, Bunsen. And then he takes off with his moose leg. So it's the only thing he doesn't listen. He turns in, he turns into a teenager and runs away with his moose leg. So, so what I'd like to encourage you to do is say, Mr. Mr. Do okay. I'll yes. change it. I'll change but, it. And, and that Pe- is a placeholder. People and on Twitter also- are laughing. This is like a big thing with Bunsen. <laughs> um, one spring he found eight moose legs. So two whole moose died out there and he found all of their legs. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So, okay. So we'll call, I'll <laughs> yell Mr. Adam, not his name. That's that. What a yeah. great tip. Thank you. And anyone who's listening, 
develop what we call placeholders instead because everyone's like, well, I got to call their name. And I'm like, yes, you do for things that relate to the four rules. And if the things that you're calling your dog for have nothing to do with the four rules, you've got to use the placeholders. And it can be Mr. <laughs> um, it can be any nickname, sweetie. Some of my clients will um, be frustrated with their dog and they're like, butthead, get over here. <laughs> so it's okay to do that. And if you do butthead, get over here. Instead of Fido, come in that negative tone, you've just preserved Fido, come. Hello, I'm Imogen and I have a story to tell you. It concerns rabbits, a couple of cats, a fox and something called a slow loris, which is a funny looking primate with big eyes. The story in question has a kidnapping, a daring escape, and later I think there's a cow made of chocolate. Oh, and the story is called Molly Whiskers and the Blue Tentacle. And there's more info about the show at mollywhiskers.com. I love it. That's so cool. Okay. Okay. That's a great tip. Thanks, Christine. Sure. Do you want me to do the second rule? It, I'm just listening. I'm smiling from ear to ear and I am listening like everybody in the audience is. So this is great. So the next one I want to share, and there's no order of doing these four rules. It's just really important to make sure you understand which ones you're not doing and focus on those. And this one is the one that can change everything if you're officially choosing to do recall training. You're going to call only when you know they're going to come. Teaching the behavior, building the behavior is something that you need to do before you can expect the behavior. Oh. And so if you have a hallway and you have treats in your pocket and you see your dog at the end of the hallway and there's nowhere else to go but to get to you, <laughs> you can crinkle that treat bag and say, Fido, come, because they will come right to you and you know they will come to you. But if you don't know, if you're out in the parking lot and there's birds and squirrels or on the trail and there's deer out there, you're not going to say Fido come in that situation. You're going to say nothing. And there's plenty of other things we can do when you need to get your dog's attention. <laughs> Instead of ruining your recall, your attention getter is your dog's name. And then you're choosing the recall word. Most people choose come. And you may need to change that to something like hear or hurry or a whistle. There's, I won't go into those details today because there's a lot to recall. Recall mm. and loose leash walking are two of the behaviors that take some investment in time for you to get doing in a, to get the results that you want. They will take time. And to start, if you just start following the rules, you'll see a big change, but there's more beyond that. So second rule to share is call only when you know they will come. Do you start um, do you start small and start working further away, like as you build up that? Uh... Very much so. Okay, okay. And that's why I just kind of gave the simple example of in a hallway with all the doors closed and your dog sees you, you can test it even with pop, 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 and run the other way. So you start <laughs> getting the behavior before you say Fido come when they're already doing it. And so adding Fido come into the formal training, anytime you're preparing a meal and your dog's coming running for that meal, just add in Fido come because you're starting those repetitions when they're coming anyways. Mm. But what I want people to remember more than anything is don't call your dog when you don't know they're going to come. If you're doing formal training, building a recall, don't call them in from outside. They don't like coming in from outside. Don't call them to do things that they're outside playing with their best friend and you haven't practiced recall and don't call them to come away from their best buddy and come to you. And anywhere you are where you're like, Oh, I'm not sure they're going to come. Use your placeholders, go get them with a leash. Yep. You know, there's many things you can do instead of calling them when you're unsure. We are at that point with Beaker. She, um, she likes to dig holes. We live of course in like on a farm, right? So I take them off leash uh, on, on adventures and, and they follow and they're really good. But if Beaker starts digging a hole, 
she does not listen. So that I use a placeholder, a leash to go get her. That's something I'm working on personally with her. Good. Um, but I don't call her anymore. When, when I see her digging, I know she will not come to me at all. So I just go collect her. <laughs> that's perfect. And that's yeah, okay. I that... feel like such a failed dog parent. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's what's so fun. I think about the four rules of recall and why I'm so passionate about recall is when you kind of get everybody understanding how dogs learn and what we do that prevents them from learning. And you just make these changes. You'll be amazed at the changes that you see. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is great. Bunsen has been always so good. Like um, we were spoiled with him. Like, Hey, come here, Bunsen. He's like, sure. Um, (laughs) He just does whatever you ask. Um, Whereas Beaker with her prey drive to go eat small things. uh, If she starts digging a hole, I think she thinks she can dig and get a gopher or some kind of ground squirrel and, have a snack because she's caught a few. So there's been a reward, I think there, but this is all great tips. Thanks, Christine. Of course. And, and every dog that has a strong prey drive is going to be harder to work with than, um, the ones that don't like Bunsen (laughs) doesn't care. A bird goes by and he's like, well, I don't know. It's kind of, but I bet that if you do the formal training, Beaker will eventually have a faster, sharper recall. I love it. I'm going to, I'm going to drive. Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited. Okay, thanks, Christine. That's number sure. two. That's number two, right? Right. Okay. So number three, call only for pleasant experiences. And we touched on that in the sense that I'm not going to call my dog from inside if they're having fun outside. I'm not going to call my dog for a bath. I'm not going to call my dog. My dog doesn't like getting in the car. So every time I put him in the car, <laughs> I don't say, Pico, come, and then put him in the car. I bring him on leash. I say, let's go. I don't ruin his attention name and his recall word to do something that he's not thrilled about. I do call him for chase games. I do do call him for cheese. Cheese is his favorite. I do call him for everything that he finds fun and Pico loves to train. So I can set up um, like a climb training platform. If he sees that thing, he's coming flying. And so I will (laughs) call him. If I pull out my climb thing, whatever he loves to do, I am going to call him for those pleasant experiences. But learning what your dog doesn't like and likes can make a huge difference on when you choose to call your dog. Mm. Beaker loves cheese. I'll tell you that. That is that was our secret um, weapon in all of her obedience training. And she did um, agility training. As soon as we figured out it was cheese, she would work and do anything for cheese. So maybe and I need to I use really that for I really encourage recall. everyone to find those favorites. You know, what are your dog's high value rewards and save them for whatever. So I do, do call. Oh, sorry about that. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, and just, you know, take time to figure out those high value treats and toys and save them for the specific behaviors that you want to build. Mm, I love it. Bunsen, what's Bunsen's favorite treat? Food? I don't know. Like, he's not picky. I guess he's just, he's just um, more, less, less of a prey drive. So if it's time to come or like Bunsen time to come, he's like, I, I'll just come because I get to lay down. Like, he's just, because <laughs> he's all done with the walk. So I guess <laughs> all dogs are different, right? That's so funny. Yes. And you can kind of work on that and People who don't seem to have the food preference or the joy, like one food preference thing that you can do is put different food choices on a cutting board, um, a large cutting board, and then just see what they gravitate to. And you have to do it a few times because a hungry dog that likes the stuff is just going to plow through all of it. But (laughs) do it a few times. And you can even do it as enrichment games under the muffin tin. They'll start scenting what they like best first. Chris, did you have a comment? Your mic was on. Uh, yeah, I just thought maybe it might be a good time to reset the room. Oh, that's, thank you. See, look, you're yeah. still here as a, you're getting your nails done. You're still my awesome co-host. Right. So I was just so fascinated with what Christine is saying. I do that every time with guests. I'm like, 100%. tell me more, tell me more. I just want to listen forever. And I forget I'm actually some kind of host. So I'm sorry about that. Um, no, that's okay. Uh, just because <laughs> there were a couple of requests and, right. um, yes, yeah. I saw that. So if you're joining us, we are simulcasting, actually triple casting. We are triple casting from Twitter spaces to clubhouse to wisdom. We are here with dog trainer extraordinaire, Christine Young, and, uh, she's on clubhouse right now speaking through the mixer, my mixer. So when you will hear her speak through the Bunsen burner icon, um, 
on Wisdom, it's just the icon. It looks normal. And then if you're on Clubhouse, everybody on Twitter Spaces will be speaking through my icon to Clubhouse. And we're we're wrap, We're going to do the a little interview section here. We're getting close to the end of it, and then we'll open up questions to the communities. And that's the room reset. I think I did. Did I do okay, Chris? Uh, absolutely, one hundred percent. Okay, back to you, Christine. Sure. And I will be wrap it up quick so we can answer questions because that's always my favorite. So the fourth is to have a party when they arrive. Party. So when, party. Yes, when you're doing formal recall training, you got to make sure you know. <laughs> you're so good with the sound effects. <laughs> You got to make sure you know the high value rewards and it doesn't necessarily need to be cheese or food. Your dog might be really toy driven. And the more that you understand what's most rewarding for your dog and give them that exciting reward for the fast recalls, it can make all of the difference. And with the food, one of the little tricks that you can do is you can do some food scatters with a handful of treats or kibble when they come to you. And if you want to really build excitement for them to be into the game, that can be super helpful. But if your dog is a drive-by recall dog that comes and then leaves, and you want to get your dog used to staying with you more, you want to take those five to 10 treats. And when they recall fast to you, you want to feed them one after the other from you. And that keeps them closer to you and reminds them to stay with you when you recall them and that it's worth staying with you. And I do want to add that as long as it's safe, in general, eight times out of 10, when you recall your dog, you want to not put them on a leash and make them stay with you. You don't want to bring them inside. You want to release them back to the fun. They're much more likely to recall if we jackpot reward them, have a party when they arrive, and then release them back to the fun that they were having. This sounds very similar to uh, like small children because we have two boys and this seems like when they were like six and seven they're like uh, hey come on in and they come and they're like scarf down a popsicle and then they're gone so <laughs> you know what i mean i don't know yes, it's, so, it's the same i've become <laughs> a much better teacher to myself and to all i hear the children comparison all the time and because dog training has helped me understand learning theory the reward-based learning system that we can set up for all learners makes a huge, huge, oh, huge difference. Yes. Yeah. I'm right. Well, I'm a, I'm my day job. I'm a teacher. So I'm, yeah, good job. I'm there with you. <laughs> yeah. The, the, I mean, if you can reward kids and it's fun and they, you know, it's a positive experience, they're going to learn way faster rather than any kind of like negative punishment like punishing anybody yelling at kids they're not going to learn anything and it's the same way with dogs i think there's new research that shows that that of course you can train dogs with uh shock collars and some of the archaic horrible old systems um but you maybe are doing a disservice to them you're training them the wrong things and their retention is way slower um so very much so. And, and I think it's a disservice to the person training too. Mm -hmm. you know, to train people to punish other animals is so many people go into it not understanding that there's so many better ways that you can find good trainers that don't use that, that make a huge difference. It's interesting with specializing in recall training, because a lot of people do feel that they want to do the shot collars for recall training. And you do not need to, there's so much you can do to get a fast recall if you're willing to put in the work and it just makes it so much more fun for everybody. Yeah. Oh, I can't imagine hurting my dogs. I just can't. I just rather, I'd rather be a little bit frustrated with Beaker digging and keep working on her recall than put some kind of shock thing on her. Um, she's just too much of a sweetheart. Anyways, that's my opinion. Um, Christine, are we okay to take some questions from the, the community? Yes, I would love to. Okay. So, Here's how it's going to roll. We are across three different platforms right now. Um, if you'd like to ask Christine a question, uh, Chris, I think Chris can still help me on Twitter spaces. Chris is bringing people up on Twitter spaces and Christine, you're a moderator on clubhouse. So you can see people with their hands up, right? Like if people have their hands up, that's how that works on clubhouse. And then you bring them up. Yes. I'm happy to bring them up over here. You betcha. Okay. And then uh, again, I've yet to have more than one person on wisdom. Come on up. So you're welcome to, 
um, request to come up. So we've got uh, we've got somebody on Twitter Spaces. Go ahead. We, this is Paula. Hi, how are you? I, Chris, I'm really excited that you're on today. This is uh, an amazing subject, and and thank you to Bunsen and Chris too. I mean, for for I mean Bunsen, I'm okay. Jason and <laughs> and Chris for Jose. I've been a long day for me. It's like I I've been tongue tied here. Anyway, um, my I have a, as Jason knows, I have a poolie who is an Hungarian sheepdog and is about as stubborn as five mules. Um, she can do recall, but we have problems with barking, but. I was wondering, I know you're in California, but I'm across the United States. I'm in Connecticut. Do you offer any like uh, FaceTime uh, uh, training things for, for cost or do you do anything like that to help people? Because we're having a really hard time with Annie barking. And um, there she goes. <laughs> oh, man. And I'm uh, sorry about that. It's okay. And, uh, no, the, the Amazon guys in the driveway, that figures. Um, but anyway, so sorry about that. Anyway, you could hear Annie barking. But anyway, um, she just, she won't bark or do anything when one of us is home. But when two of us are home, she goes absolutely crazy. And we can't seem to get a handle on it. And we have two little Brussels Griffons and the other Brussels Griffon now starts to chime with her. So it's almost like it's a domino effect. So I didn't know if you offered anything to the you know the public in general for your services and and what you wanted to say about that but thank you for all your tips because i think they're amazing and and i really appreciate it oh thank you so much and yes i do online sessions and you'd be amazed how much you can learn online my clients who do the combination of online and in person grow the fastest but i think it's really interesting how when people can only do online work with me because they don't live nearby the um, amount of focus you can do with online work is pretty astounding. And I can also send you some stuff in regards to the barking. It sounds like you really have your hands full. So make sure you message me and I'll send you some things to listen to. And hopefully that'll get you started. Okay. Are you on, are you on Twitter that I can message you or how would I do that? You can, you can message me on Twitter. Um, and Paula, I'll put I, up something in the nest that Christine has tweeted, and then th that way you can find her profile easily. Oh, that would be great. Thank you very much. No, I really appreciate it, because like I said, we're kind of like beating our head against the wall, and and we're trying everything, but we do the sit, and she's, sit, she's quiet for like 30 seconds. <laughs> if one of us starts walking, she just goes right into it again. So it, it's, it's been a little frustrating on our end, but I would almost be happy to learn something on FaceTime with you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, I'd so be happy to help. And there's a lot you can do. And rather than get a little bit off topic today, I want to send you some stuff to listen to, and then we can do a follow-up video session. Oh, that would be great. Well, thank you very much for taking my question. And again, um, much success to you. And I'm a dog walker too, so I can so relate. And um, it's a lot of fun. I do the big guys, the little guys, and everything in between. So, <laughs> Oh, great. <laughs> again. Great, great, great. Um, I look forward to doing some work with you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paula. Um, Christine, we have somebody on Wisdom, and I see somebody on Clubhouse. Who who would you like to go to first? Let's do Wisdom first, and then we'll go to okay. Suzanne. Okay, all right. So we've got Cecilia Grace on Wisdom. Okay, so Cecilia, I'm bringing you up. Thank you for being a Wisdom listener. I've set my timer for two minutes, so you only have about two minutes to ask your question. Hi, great. Hi, Hi Cecilia. This is great. Thanks so much. Um, I was wondering what's the best way to get the – I have – Two seven-month-old American Staffies, very strong. What's the best way to get them to stop pulling on the leash? I was recommended or suggested the, to use the choke collar. What do you think about that? I think there's many other things you can do that can be more helpful long-term. If you're using any, anything like a prong collar or a choke collar, you're mm -hmm. not focusing on building the right behavior. You're trying to suppress the bad behavior. And the more you focus on building the behavior that you want, the it can be slower, but anything that we learn slow and steady and implement over time lasts longer. And it also right. will build the bond that you have with your dog. So anytime we're punishing a dog, we're losing some of the bond and desire for them to work with us. Anytime we're showing the dog how to do loose leash work, 
and how to do it well and praise and reward them for it through the games that we do, you're building a behavior that lasts long term. Great. Yeah, that's wonderful. So what was the best uh, recommendation then for them uh, to not pull on the leash? Because so they're the so strong. And, and Jason can tell me how much I should go into this subject, but the first you, thing I we would got, recommend... We have, we have time. Go ahead. Okay, good. Um, so so just a second. Cecilia, your time on wisdom is going to drop off, um, but you can no still... No problem. I'll be can, listening. You can still listen. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, Thanks so much. I want, I want you to walk... The two priorities is I want you to walk them separately, and I want you to do yeah, exercises yeah. inside and in the yard first that create the patterns that you want to have outside. Anytime we do behaviors... Inside with low distraction, often starting in a bathroom or small quiet room in the house with no other dogs, no other people that are distracting, the name game that we talked about can be part of building that foundation. So getting the name game individually with each dog and then building on that can help you get good behaviors individually but anytime I'm working with people with loose leash work, I never walk the two dogs together until each of them has the individual behavior. Each year, an average of 10 tropical storms develops over the Atlantic Ocean, the Caribbean Sea, and the Gulf of Mexico. Six of those become hurricanes, and roughly five strike the United States coastline. Every week during hurricane season, we talk with tropical weather scientists, forecasters, hurricane hunters, and broadcasters, and hurricane chasers. Hear their thoughts and stories about their research, forecasts, and experiences with hurricanes on the Hurricane Center podcast. Okay, um, Cecilia's gone. Wisdom has a timer uh, for how long a guest can be on stage. So hopefully that answered your question. Um, Cecilia, uh, actually, Christine, do you have a website that Cecilia could check out? Wisdom doesn't really have a, an ability to post links, but I can put it in the name of the show on Wisdom. Sure. It's the puppycarecompany.com. Okay, that's, and, that's perfect. And that link as well, that's the four rules of recall, goes yep. to the homepage of my website. Can you say that again? The puppy... The puppycarecompany.com. Okay. I'll put that in the title for people in wisdom. Wisdom doesn't allow um, links yet. That's fascinating that it cuts people off time-wise too. Yeah. You, social audio. Yeah. Wisdom, thing. Wisdom's kind of cool. You can only have one person as a speaker uh, and then one guest and you set the time limit for how long the guest is on stage with you. Fascinating. <laughs> it's kind of cool. It's really, it's good if you're doing like tutorials or something like that, where you can have like an in-depth discussion. Okay, so Cecilia on Wisdom, it's the Puppy Care Company. I'm sure if you searched it, you'd you'd be able to find more information from Christine. Okay, uh, Christine, we'll head over to Clubhouse. Uh, I'll let you bring, be the moderator for Clubhouse. This is your wheelhouse. Sure. Hi, Suzanne. Good to see you. Hi, Christine. Sorry, I'm a little hoarse. Um, so I, if you PTR, I will uh, show you one of my loves. I have three dogs. I think we've talked about it before, and they are the love of my life right now because my children are off at college. So Sadie on the right is a German Shepherd. She's purebred, but she was a runt of a litter, so they gave her up to the German Shepherd Foundation. And we adopted her, and we've had her since she was three months old. And she's really, really nice, except when there's a cat involved. <laughs> um, so our whole... Our whole being is if there's a cat that comes into our yard, she goes crazy. If there's a cat that comes uh, on her path on a walk, oh my gosh, she goes crazy. She could care less about anything other than cats. We go on a walk with her and she is on a cat hunt. Um, so um, unfortunately, uh, I walk with my husband generally, and that's because we have the three dogs, two bigs and one little. Um, and uh, so he insists on putting on her a pinch collar. Um, and I know it, it hurts me, um, but she actually is pretty well-mannered until there's a cat. And then she could care less about the pinch collar. Everything goes to heck. Um, so I'm wondering if there's something else that we could do rather than put on the pinch collar. And if I should, 
she doesn't want to go on walks without her um her her siblings is what I call them but um my animals are a pack and they they like to go on walks together so I've tried to take her by herself to see if I could train her by herself but she she gets very upset she doesn't even want to go on the walk so any any suggestions Christine thanks Suzanne Sure. And I like how you described your question because there's a lot of information there. And whether it's a prong collar or any type of choking pinch collar, I don't ever want someone to take that off immediately and assume they have control of their dog. So until you proof other methods and know you feel safe on a harness with a front and a back clip that you've worked with and you know you feel safe transitioning to that, it's okay to use the tools you have to keep everyone safe. And before I give you some ideas of what to do next, I want you to notice her, like you've said, I want you to recognize that her desire to go only with her buddies can indicate different things, including some anxiety. And so it's hard for any of us to listen when we are anxious. And so we, the more that we build her confidence and to do stuff with her on her own, just inside in different rooms away from everybody, and just in ways that when you and your husband go for a walk, you guys can distance yourself with each other in the safest, calmest areas that you're teaching her. Let's say you teach her a sit, a down, a nose touch, a spin, whatever some favorite behaviors are. You're teaching those inside. And then you and your husband separate, and who's ever willing to train your shepherd more regularly asks for the... And I want you to think about a spin or a nose touch rather than a more... Um, for a dog who's anxious, asking them to sit or lay down in an environment they might be anxious in, that might be harder than, can you come and touch your nose to my hand? Can you do a spin and move around and have a loose, wiggly body? If you teach those things to build confidence, that can help your dog pay attention and listen to you more because you've built up that confidence before you worry about the whole cat thing is a whole other ball game that there's a lot of particulars that you can do potentially with some counter conditioning, but I'd rather you think about building up engagement and off the top of my head, I want you to look up Leslie McDevitt's pattern games and that type of engagement. Anyone who wants to get more engaged behavior from your dogs. One of my mentors is Leslie McDevitt and her pattern games are one of the best ways for you to do some simple repetitive tasks that creates confidence and focus with your dog first in quiet boring areas and you will slowly acclimate into areas that are more distracting and more difficult for your dog to listen is that helpful suzanne you there yeah, sorry. I was I was um, taking notes in my notes section on my phone. Um, yeah, that is helpful. And you know, it's interesting when you said the whole anxiety thing. Sadie is extremely anxious. Um, if if we welcome somebody into our house, she immediately goes and gets we call it a baby. She gets a toy, puts it in her mouth, and runs runs away so that she can see the person, but she doesn't want the person to touch her. Um, However, if someone comes into our house that has not been invited in, she immediately goes crazy barking and it becomes, we, we call it, she goes into full German Shepherd mode where don't go near her, her teeth are big. So um, she definitely has that anxiety that you're talking about. And yeah, I'm going to cry with her, the nose, the touching the nose, because you're right, um, just telling her to sit, she gets very anxious. Like, where is everybody else going? What is everybody else doing? Um, I think she has ADHD just like me, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, most anxious dogs, um, I love that you understand that. And typical German Shepherd behavior um, with guests coming into the house, she's doing a great job doing her job. So make sure you don't get upset with that. Just learn how to work with that energy and learn how to teach her those pattern games and safe spaces for her to be. Yes, totally appreciate it. Thanks, Christine. You're welcome. I love that high 10. I haven't been on Clubhouse in a while and I don't know how to do that. So thank you for that. <laughs> oh, let me show you. If you there's there's emojis now on Clubhouse, right? 
Yay. There's all sorts of new emojis. So yeah, I have to... if you just hold your finger on your picture, uh-huh. you're going to see that a bunch of emojis comes up and you can even put a gift up there. Wow. I love Fancy it. That's super cool. I'm on uh, club. You. I'm running through club deck because it's the only way we can do this triple cast. So I'm not on a phone through clubhouse. Oh, I love it. Every time I jump on here, there's something new to play with. Thank you, Suzanne. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, okay, so we have we have Lynn on um, Twitter Spaces that I'm bringing up, and that uh, person you mentioned, Leslie Mick. Some, I'm sorry, Leslie. Leslie McDevitt, Control Le- Unleashed, is one of her books. That's right. fabulous. Um, I found her a YouTube with her, and I've put that on Twitter Spaces so people can check Great. out the YouTube link. She's amazing. Perfect. Lynn, do you have a question for Christine? My name is Tom Buck, and this is The Enthusiasm Project. Join me each week for deep dives exploring the world of what it means to be an independent creator on YouTube, starting your own creative business, and keeping a positive, enthusiastic mindset along the way. New episodes of The Enthusiasm Project are available every Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. I do. Um, hi. Um, so uh, our dog Layla is a retriever um, shepherd mix and she's almost nine years old. And a few years ago, a, a black colored SUV went by and a dog barked out the window at her and scared her. And ever since then, she now lunges when she, and barks when she sees um black colored suvs and she also picked up the behavior of barking at other dogs from inside our car out at them and she had never done either of those behaviors before so she does have anxiety um and we work a lot with that like around storms and things but i'm not sure what to what to do to try to help her with this kind of like acquired behavior Oh, that's hard. And it's amazing how a certain situation can trigger our dogs to fall into sensitizing and being like I the part that I think so cool is they're so smart, you know, for her to notice that and um, be sensitized to it is when we think of it in a more positive light of how sensitive they are to understand things. What we need to do is counter condition and figure out ways for her to feel safe when those um does anyone you know have a black car similar to this i i don't and i try to anticipate like if i can see one coming i try to talk to her before you know it approaches but sometimes when you're walking in like the neighborhood it comes up behind you and catches sure. us and, both and, and besides the counter conditioning that you would need to do for it um there's plenty of other things that you can do as well because it sounds like the overreactivity that you're having inside the car um is um i'm myself and many other dog trainers were super busy because many dogs will behave this way for lots of different reasons that we don't necessarily need to spend too much time figuring out the reasons why our dogs are struggling but understanding that they are struggling rather than being um, thinking that they're behaving badly. They're doing behaviors that they need support and help from us on how to understand that they're safe and that you can guide them to do other things with the foundation work. The pattern games that I mentioned before is some of the best pattern work that you can learn and do it well inside then in your backyard, and then you can bring it to walks so that when that car comes up from behind you, you've probably gotten good at noticing the body language of your dog being a little unsure of something. And as soon as that happens, you can, one of the pattern games is called the one, two, three game. You can start doing that one, two, three game as soon as your dog starts showing you through body language that they need your support. And because you've conditioned this game, and I'll, I'll do a quick version of the of Leslie McDevitt's one two three game you're going to condition this by similar to the name game saying three feed two three feed one two three 
feed. So you start with the easy saying the word three and feed, and you build it up to one, two, three. Once you've built this up and are able to say one, two, three and feed your dog and they're able to stay nearby and with you, when you're out walking and your dog shows you with that tucked tail or ears back that a black SUV might be nearby, because you've practiced this over a hundred times inside and in the backyard and in short walks before you know any cars are going to come that are like that and gotten them back in and really condition this well, your dog can be like, oh, okay, one, two, three. I know that game. I know food's going to happen. I can pay attention to this and be safe and turn away from that car and go with my mom where I feel safer instead of overreacting to that car. I'm saying this as if it's easy and fast to do it. It's not. This takes time. <laughs> as if on cue okay. the train. I, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Good question. And I am happy to send you more information if it's helpful. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Thank you. When Bunsen was, I think it was like eight or nine months, um, there was uh, a, a, a man who was inebriated and lost and or looking to break into our property, came onto our property and was up to no good. So I went out and yelled at this guy, <laughs> called the police, and uh, Bunsen associated men with hoodies with this guy as being up to no good. So it took a while for Bunsen to get over, you know, he, he still to this day is maybe not as friendly with uh, men with hoodies or hats. Uh, mm -hmm. But like right after that incident for about a year, he did not really want having have anything to do with men that had a hoodie or a hat. It took a lot of um, warming him up to that. So it's, it's not a slow process. And, and I think he was just trying like, you're right. Their dogs are smart. He's just trying to help. He's trying to protect yes. us. Yes. And himself, he's just kind of scared and unsure and the more we build calm confidence through the, I really encourage everyone to do, learn what you want to train with whatever behaviors you're struggling with. And once you learn some good um, recall games or pattern games, two to 10 minutes, five to 10 treats, twice a day, five days a week. If you commit to that, the difference that you will see is amazing. And it takes some gumption to get in there and have your treats and do your two to 10 minutes and learn the right timing and mechanics. But it is so powerful. And the changes that you can see by doing this will make a huge difference. Like anything, it takes practice. Yes. And it becomes this wonderful muscle memory that what your dog can do once you invest, you'll just be so amazed what <laughs> they can do. Ah. Oh. They're so great. Well, we're out of speakers everywhere, so we'll put another call out. Um, Christine, are you good till the top of the hour? That was kind of, uh, I thought, the timeline here, hey? Yes, I, I, an hour is good for me. After that, I usually, <laughs> I, I really enjoyed, it took a while to figure out the timing of these, and I like the hour or less ones, because after an hour, um, I need to go get something to eat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got another uh, speaker on Twitter. It looks like nobody else on uh, clubhouse or, or wisdom, uh, Jennifer's coming up to the, to the stage. Hi, Jennifer. Do you have a question for Christine? Yeah. Sorry. I've never spoken before. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> um, yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I actually have a question and I came in late. So if you've already gone over this, you know, I'll go back and listen again. I have a 10 year old golden retriever and I am looking into getting a puppy. And so this would be more about introducing them and working things out. My golden, like I said, she's 10. She's not super outgoing with other dogs, but she's fine when she, she kind of knows them, you know, she was attacked a number of times when she was um, younger. So she's got some anxiety around that. If you have any suggestions, I would be very interested. I love this question because I get to talk about my two specialties. We've done recall and now we're talking about puppies. Yay. Oh, and yay. <laughs> I love that you are doing your research beforehand. And if oh, yeah. I heard right, you do you know what dog you're getting or you're still looking into it? I'm still looking into it. I'm thinking a golden retriever, but I'm also looking at Bernie's and some of the giant breeds. 
So if you go to my website, there's a link under resources to find okay. great breeders and rescues oh, and to learn to ask the right questions to make sure yes. that the dog that you're getting comes from a great rescue adoption option or Absolutely. a great breeder. So besides resourcing the right people to get your dog from, the next thing I want you to consider doing is making sure as you're choosing, is this dog the right fit? So if you're thinking of a retriever, you want to make sure you potentially are getting a family line dog that isn't a working line dog. And just <laughs> That's, depending on... Beaker was a working line dog for yeah. sure. <laughs> it, it amazes yeah, my, me how... my current dog. Oh, go ahead. No, you're fine. And I just, I don't mind the conversation going in this direction because if that's all I could do would be to help people get the right fit for their family beforehand. It's amazing oh. how many people get in over their head, not even knowing. This is exactly what I need help with. Yeah. <laughs> and so and the dog I have now, oh, sorry, the dog I have now, her mother was a therapy dog, which is part of the reason I went with that breeder because I wanted that kind of personality and smart, but also not like a hunting dog. That's great. And again, I would recommend something like that with the research that you're doing. And once okay. you do enough research to know that the dog that you're going to bring into your life is potentially a good fit, because of course we never know. I right. want you to prioritize your senior dog. Um, okay. You know, there's there's lots we can do and there's lots I can help you with for the puppy. And I'll give you some quick tips on that as well. But so often the senior dog is the one who gets the short end of the stick in these situations. Oh. And so creating yes. <laughs> spaces now where your okay. senior dog can get away from the puppy is key. <laughs> I've thought about doggy daycare as soon as she's vaccinated. <laughs> But again, that whole period of time, that's a couple of yes. months before all the vaccination is, you need to do something as simple as before you even get your puppy now, if you know you're going to get mm -hmm. one with a senior dog, you mm -hmm. can condition your senior dog to enjoy a space that you know that they like to go to and they can get away from. And whether you set up an exercise pen, gated communities, figure out what your senior dog likes and start conditioning that space now, bringing enrichment and other options for your dog to have fun games and food and frozen enrichment. Um, okay. And you can learn more about that on one of the links at my website. There's a whole big enrichment guide. If you condition spaces for your senior dog now, to feel comfortable in those spaces and make sure the puppy can't get to the senior dog and let your, and make sure you're paying equal amount, if not more attention to your senior dog, having getting help from fam family and friends. So that dog yeah. feels comfortable in the situation that will go really far. Okay. That sounds great. Um, I was also, um, I have family and friends in the area who love golden retrievers and love dogs. Would it also potentially be helpful to, you know, have outings for one dog or both dogs, like separately, so I can have one on one time with the other dog? Definitely. You're, you're so on the right track. The more anybody who has multi-dog households does private time with each of the dogs, it builds the relationship and it's so worth it. Okay. Um, and while I have you, I do want to touch on a couple of things yeah. with a new puppy in case you forget to um, pay attention with all that you have going on. Oh, I want no, please to... do. <laughs> Say that again? Oh, please do. It's been a while since oh, I've had a puppy. Yeah. Like <laughs> and you'll be overwhelmed and it's worth it. Yes. So, um, yes. <laughs> I want to make sure the first few days at home are really calm. There's such a tendency with a new puppy to invite everybody over and to have a million toys and a million people and a million things to do. And I want you to think about that new puppy as if you're going into a new 500 person corporation and you get thrown into this new environment. You don't know anybody and people are just saying, come do this, come do this, come over here and do this. That kind of experience versus going to that big giant company with all this new stuff that people are demanding from you and exposing you to. If you had a little office and a buddy that privately and calmly said, here's where things are. Here's a couple of things. Let's do this slow and I'll hang out with you here till you're ready to go to the kitchen and have a cup of coffee. You're able to create an environment that your dog can feel calm and bond with you. Of course, socializing is key and we want to do this, but not the first day, not the first three days. Have it be really zen-like so they can settle in and bond with you. 
And then you can start socialization and bring the whole family over once your dog is calm and bonded. Okay. Would you recommend not having my older dog there then? Well, again, there's lots of little details that we can talk about. Okay, and getting okay. the scent, you know, if you got from a breeder nearby that you can bring the scent back and forth. And there's just so many little things that you can do to make it easier for both of them. But it really depends on your setup, your situation, and um, making sure, like, if you did daycare for one or the other, does your older dog like going to the friends or daycare? Making sure that experience for the dog that you have is the experience that you want them to that will make them feel better actually than, than more anxious, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, absolutely. My older dog would hate daycare. So she would go stay with a family member or <laughs> a friend, <laughs> like would hate daycare. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jennifer, are you, was your question answered? Yeah, no, that's great. Um, I'll definitely check out your website. Thanks so much. That's helped me feel more confident. <laughs> You're welcome. Happy to help. And I'm excited for you. Hey, and thanks for thank thanks for speaking too. It's it's uh it's kind of nerve wracking to speak the first time. Yes, very much so. I'm sure y'all <laughs> heard my tremble. <laughs> uh, okay, well, thank you. Christine, do you have time for one more question? Sure. Okay, so we'll go to Laura, who's been waiting patiently on um, Twitter Spaces. It takes a second to connect up to the quote unquote stage, so we'll just give Laura a second. I still see the spinning wheel of connection. May not go. We'll give Laura a couple more seconds, maybe some tech difficulties. Laura, if you are on desktop that you cannot be a... Oh, the, maybe it worked. Laura, hello? Hi there. Hi, do you have a question for Christine? Yeah, but for some reason, um, all of a sudden, I can't really understand you at all. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, can't hear, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Well, I can... Um, it might just be my phone. It's... um. <clears throat> funny go ahead do you have a let question? me see if um i can um I, I can hear you a little bit but anyway here's my my problem oh, and thank you for taking the call i have a, a 12 year old case hound and she's recently gotten funny about well she's actually been funny about going for walks all her life but neighborhood dogs that she knows and she gets along with, I mean, she sniff noses and everything. Um, she doesn't want to go past their houses when we're out on walks. And one of them, if they start barking, if they're on, if, we're, if I take my dog outside and this dog is outside on her um, front porch where she, that she can't get off of, if it starts barking, the neighbor's dog, my dog hightails it right back into the house and i'm i don't know what causes this why it's happening um i've not seen i mean she's never had any fights with these dogs so unless they're whispering sweet nothings in her ear that i don't know <laughs> about and they're not so sweet i have no idea what her problem is and you this is something that what i heard is she's maybe struggled with walks um, but this behavior as she gets older is exaggerating. Is that correct? Well, yeah, when she was a puppy, I'd have to like kind of drag her on walks, but a K sounds I found can be kind of home bodies because they're, they take their dog watch or their home watching really seriously. So that's what I always figured it was. And for years, I never walked her because it was just, I mean, I, it was embarrassing dragging my dog around the block. But I would still take her out for rides in the car. We'd go to Home Depot or Pet Smart. Oh, I even took her to bars. She loves going to bars. <laughs> but she's more of a people person than a dog person. And she has been all her life. But she's had friends that were dogs. Like she had a, I had a neighborhood pit bull puppy that was 90 pounds at one point. And she loved playing with it. Like, don't get me. I mean, I, I never figured that out. I mean, this dog would run over the top of her and she'd go rolling on the ground. And she was fine with that. So I, I mean, maybe, uh, I don't know. Maybe she just needs, um, I don't know what she needs. Maybe she just needs a Valium. Well, I actually think you do have a good sense of what she needs because I like that you didn't take her on walks when she didn't want to go. And you provided yeah. her with 
people and other things to do. And dogs don't need to go on walks and there's plenty we can do mentally and even physically to stimulate them inside. So if your dog's struggling with walks, there's no need to take them on walks. And the more you can learn different enrichment activities and bringing and inviting, bringing them to people that they like and bringing them, um, bringing people over that they like can be stimulating. And I don't know if you heard me talking about that analogy of going to a big giant company, I want you to kind of think about in that big, if we have to go work at a big giant company with 500 new people, there's going to be plenty of people for me in that big company that I don't want to spend much time with. And then there'll (laughs) be some favorite people that I'd love to spend a lot of time with. And I just think it's really interesting. And before I became a trainer, I did the same thing. Dogs are so resilient and we expect them to get along with every other dog. And they do Mm -hmm. much better than people in general in this, but we have to recognize that they understand each other's body language much better than we do. And the more we find the right friends for them to spend time with, and the more we provide them for what's important to them and what helps them feel good, the more they're able to relax and feel good about things. But I don't want you to feel bad about not walking your dog. And I think that's a good choice. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's, um, well, we have a fenced yard right now, but she can still go next door and get loose. So I, I only let her back there when I can pay attention and at that. And at night we have raccoons and stuff and I don't want her going out in the dark and messing with something she shouldn't. So I do have to walk her and we live on a dead end street that's real short. So I have to go by these dogs houses in order to walk her. Um, this just gets frustrating when she gets barked at and it's like, oh, come on, you know, you need, I know you need to do business. Well, I recommend that you find a local trainer and I'm happy to uh-huh. recommend them. And there's some resources on my resource tab on my website that can mm-hmm. help you create a routine for the walk so that everybody feels better. It's really worth the investment for you to do this. It will make a huge oh, yeah. difference in how everybody feels. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, I've also recently started putting CBD on her, oil on her every day for like the thunderstorms in the 4th of July. And she handled the 4th of July and fireworks really well this year. Um, however, once, you know, doesn't mean anything because some years she doesn't, it doesn't bother her at all. So is that something that might help with her walking and anxiety in time? I've heard mixed results from people on any of the products that we can try with dogs. And so I, I have some friends and colleagues that have had great results from CBD products and other things similar with um, supplements. And I've had friends that have had no results from them or even negative. So I think it's the dog in front of you. And if I was investing in any of those, I'd get involved with the experts that really understood the quality and choices there. Okay, that's great. Okay. Great question, Laura. Thank you for asking. Laura, do you know what the website is for Christine? Uh, what is it like? Um, it's the Puppy Care Company. If you're on puppy, your puppy. phone, there's a, um, there's a little thing up at the top of the chat called The Nest. And if you scroll through that, it's the puppycarecompany.com. Um, okay. Yeah. And then you can find Christine's stuff there. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no problem. Well, Christine, we're at the top. We went over a little bit. Hopefully that was okay. But this was such a fun experiment. And I think everybody learned so much from you. Thank you for being a guest on our special edition of Pet Chat. Oh, thank you for having me. It was great. And I don't mind going over. I really love the questions and being able to get people to invest a little bit of training time with their dogs. The results that we all see is amazing. So thanks for all the interest. Yeah. And you know what's really cool is... We're linking together dog communities on three different social platforms now, right? There's the community on Clubhouse that's listening. There's like uh, 30, 35 people on Twitter, and there's uh, around 40 people listening on Wisdom. So we've linked together this huge group of people that are just gaining knowledge, which I think is just so neat in this time. Instead uh, Instead of us just being insular, we're now all together. I think that's pretty cool. I love it. And I look forward to doing more. I'm going to go try to learn wisdom. I've been inspired by (laughs) friends who use it. And I just love hearing the difference. And I'll get over there one of these days and I'll get better at Twitter. Thanks to you. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, no problem. We'll we'll talk on Twitter, I think, um, about setting up maybe another one of these in, in a while. Sounds great.
Okay. All right. I'm just going to do my wrap up and then, uh, and then we'll, we're done. It's my wrap up song. People who come to my spaces, they know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for being our, uh, our guest today, Christine, on a special edition of Pet Chat. Um, your knowledge was so appreciated. I learned something. We had great people who had amazing questions. Thank you to all of the speakers across the three different social audio sites. Really appreciate you being brave and asking questions. And to everybody in the audience, thanks for coming and listening. You could be anywhere in the world, but you're listening on social audio. This Saturday on Twitter and on Clubhouse and on Wisdom, we run our Pet Chat space. Pet Chat runs at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. That's 8 p.m. Eastern. The other social audio site that we run is very much science-based. It runs on Tuesday at 7 p.m. Mountain Time, 9 p.m. Eastern. And I actually forget the guest that we have next week. Um, I don't know. I think I think it is a scientist from Middle Island in Australia uh, where they train guardian dogs to protect endangered penguins from foxes. Um, So that's going to be a pretty cool chat. If it's not her, it's an arachnologist. We're either talking about spiders or we're talking about guardian dogs. It's going to be a cool chat on Tuesday. I'm just a hot mess and can't find my schedule. Um, So (laughs) as we say our goodbyes, thank you again, Christine, for being an awesome guest today. Um, I hope we can connect in the future. This was so cool. Yes, and before we leave here on Clubhouse, can you put the link up to your club so people can join that pet chat room on Saturday of their Clubhousers? Okay, I will have to figure that out. I do not have a and club. So we can just do that next time, but I know Jason and I are just trying to help each other grow the community. And um, just if you guys just click on the Bunsen and Burner icon here in Clubhouse, you can probably get to him to find that Saturday room. Right. I've got to do a better job of advertising on Clubhouse. Um, What's cool on Clubhouse is you can schedule things ahead of time more than one. On Twitter, you can only do one at a time. So it's a bit annoying. But that thank you for the suggestion, Christine. Sure. Happy to help. Okay, we are wrapping things up. Everybody on Twitter, we'll see you hopefully on Saturday for fun games, prizes, and just chatting about your pets. And if you want some science stuff, come check us out next Tuesday. Okay, take care, everybody. Closing in three, two, one. Um, Christine, can I close the room or did you want to do that on Clubhouse? You can close the room. And what's nice, I just noticed that we had three people share the room. We should have, we got to remember to ask people to do that. Okay. I forgot to, I forgot to do that on Twitter. I was like, Hey guys, share the, share the thing. I forgot. I was just so excited. Between us, as we get doing more, we'll figure it out. That's right. That's right. (laughs) This was great. Okay. Thanks, Jason. This was amazing. Thank you. Bye-bye.